we spent two years teaching you through the seven Sabbaths and the seven days of creation, the ultimate goal for everything is rest. And as we understand in the new creation, we get light. That's the first day work of grace. He divides the waters of the spirit from the waters of the soul. He brings forth resurrection life and fruit. We're under the power of Christ. The moon is the, is the church. The stars are the overcomers. The fish and birds are the individual lives within the sea that we must rescue. We must become fishermen. And we find that there's those who live in the heavenlies. We find that finally man is the sixth day creation and the seventh day is rest. And all of these pertain to a goal that Father wants to bring into our life. So we had the journey of Israel from Egypt to Canaan. There's seven actual places for them to go. There's seven pieces of the furniture of the tabernacle. There's the seven feasts of Yahweh. And there's seven tabernacles in the Bible. And each one of these have their what we call first day work of grace. Each one of these illustrates all the way through as we go all the way across this way. Each of these adds a new dimension to this work of grace in this period of time. What we're on is understanding the seventh day or what rest is or what Sabbath is because Sabbath is your victory. And until we understand Sabbath, you don't understand Sabbath till you get there. And Sabbath is your victory. This is the day in type and shadow of your victory and your deliverance from any problem that you have. Does he want to deliver you? The answer is yes. Okay, now we can take that chart off. I want you to turn to Deuteronomy 5, 15. Well, actually, we'll start with uh, Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 12 through verse 15. The Sabbath was always the day of rest, the seventh day, designed from creation, given to Adam and Eve in the garden and kept by all nations during the antediluvian period. When Noah came out and through Shem, Ham, and Japheth began to reestablish divine order upon this earth, the Sabbath was reinstituted, the day of rest, to learn to rest in his creation. The secret was Learn to enjoy the finished product. That's, that's, that's all that it means. Learn to enjoy the finished product. Learn to enjoy what Father does. Now, if you have to struggle, you cannot enter into your rest. Now, when Israel was delivered, a new dimension of the Sabbath was now given. It no longer pertained just to resting in the finished work. Deuteronomy 5, verse 12. Keep the Sabbath or seventh day to sanctify it. Now, the seventh day means it can't belong to you. To sanctify means it belongs to Him. We have to learn the distinction between what is ours and what is His. A tithe is an example. He said, I don't care what you earn, but 10% of it is mine. That's sanctified. That money becomes sanctified. It is His. The word sanctify simply means it's his. The seventh day is his. It's not mine. Why? What difference does it make? Keep the Sabbath day to sanctify it as Yahweh thy Elohim hath commanded thee. Six days thou shalt labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of Yahweh thy Elohim in it thou shalt not do any work, thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, nor thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thine ox, nor thine ass, nor any of the cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates, that thy manservant, thy maidservant may rest as well as thou. Now, verse 15 brings in a new thing to Israel. And remember that thou wast a servant or slave in the land of Egypt, and that Yahweh thy Elohim brought thee out thence through a mighty hand and by a stretched out arm. Now that word stretched out arm is the Hebrew word zorora, which means shank bone of the lamb. It was the lamb shank bone 
by which he brought them out. They were to eat lamb and then go for the border, right? Kind of like Taco Bell, run for the border. When you ate the lamb, you ran for the border. You went to cross the Red Sea. And he said he brought them out through a mighty hand and by a stretched out arm or by the lamb arm, which we, when we do Passover, we show you the actual Passover that Christ did as he himself would hold up the lamb and he'd say, this is me. I'm the mighty arm. It was the lamb that became the power. Therefore, Yahweh, thy Elohim, commanded thee to keep the Sabbath day. Now, why did he command Israel to keep the Sabbath as opposed to the normal Sabbath? Because now, remember, I want you to remember that it becomes a part of your redemption. The Sabbath, therefore, is linked to a redemptive program. Now, in the New Testament, there are exactly seven Sabbath miracles. Seven, not eight, not six. Seven. How many resurrections of the dead are recorded in the Gospels? Three. Why? Because he rose from the dead on the third day. There, there's specific outline in the Bible. There are seven miraculous healings on the Sabbath. Now, there were many more, but in the Bible talks about them. He healed many on the Sabbath, but it said there were specifically seven Sabbath miracles. Now, the interesting thing about these seven miracles is every one of them were incurable cases, okay? This wasn't just somebody being sick. This wasn't somebody that, that, that would eventually get well. These were miracles that had he not moved in on the scene, they would have died with their problem. They were incurable situation how many of you have ever felt i'm in an incurable place there's no cure i'm this is it i'm done for um is there hope for me if you understand the sabbath yes because this is your passover passover was to be remembered on a seventh day principle basis so that every seventh day you no longer thought of creation you'd think of deliverance Every Sabbath, I want you to remember I delivered you. So now we got deliverance involved. Now, let's go to Isaiah, which was a verse that we gave a while back when we started this series. Isaiah 61, that everybody preaches but doesn't know what the context of where to put it. Because Isaiah 61 is the very scripture that our Savior, the first time he got to go into the synagogue when he was anointed as a prophet, went and preached this scripture and said, this day is the scripture fulfilled, which was a Sabbath scripture. Isaiah 61, the spirit of Yahweh Elohim is upon me. All oh, saints, if you could ever get this into your spirit. The spirit. The Hebrew word for spirit is ruach, breath. The very movement of Father's in-breathing is upon me. The spirit of Yahweh. What is Yahweh? Yahweh means all that I am. When you speak of power, you speak of wisdom, you speak of knowledge, you speak of victory, you speak of holiness, it's all Yahweh is the name Yahweh is the noun of the verb I am. Remember we, we, on Mother's Day, I love doing this on Mother's Day. The sacred name is called the Tetragrammaton, the four letters. Small vowel there, and a small vowel there. But there's only four letters in Hebrew, Yahweh. By the way, well, I'm going to go ahead and say this one first. Adam's wife's name was, in Hebrew, same name, only without the Y. Pronounced and spelled in English, Eve. It's not Eve at all. It's H-W-H, which they transliterated as E-V-E. That's the Hebrew word. You can find it in any lexicon. You can find it in any Hebrew Bible. It's there. That Eve, who was called the mother of what? Living, because the word Yahweh means that which lives. That which gives life to oppose that which brings death. So whosoever shall call on the name of Yahweh, whoever calls on life, whoever brings life into the situation will have deliverance from death or from dying or being destroyed. The interesting thing is that when you said the word salvation in Hebrew, you add an S in here, which in Hebrew is a sheen. Actually, I should probably just 
spell it like we would uh, in Hebrew. But this is actually Yahshua. So our Savior's name was Yahshua because he was going to come in his Father's name. Isn't that what it says? I will come in my Father's name. Thou shalt call his name Yahshua. Now everybody saw the Yah, but nobody has seen that salvation in the Bible, he brought salvation, he brought deliverance. This word, which you can look it up in any concordance, the word salvation or deliverance is the word Yeshua. Every Jew to this day that reads the Old Testament, every time he comes to the word salvation, actually says the word Yeshua. He doesn't even know what he's saying. And we say the word Yeshua, and we're not too sure that we know what we're saying. Well, it's a name. Whosoever shall call on the name of Yeshua shall be Yeshua. In other words, the name becomes a reality in you. You become the result of the name. So Yeshua is simply the S put in between this, and then this noun form becomes a verb of deliverance. Shua. Thou shalt call his name Yah, Shua. So Eve is the mother of life because this comes from the uh, noun form which also becomes in a verb form meaning to live. He who was, who is, and is to come. And in Exodus 3.14, the King James simply says, takes this verb that is given to Eve as a name and simply says, I am. Now, how many know that you were made in His image? You can't even describe yourself without saying, I am. There's, there's a big difference between you and your heavenly Father because when Father speaks, there are some things He can't say with the words, I am. You'll never hear Yahweh say, I am frustrated. You'll never hear Yahweh say, I'm You'll never hear Yahweh say, I'm disgusted. You'll never hear Yahweh say, I'm dead. You'll never hear Yahweh say, I am defeated. But he does say, I am the glorious one. I am the victory. I am the life. I am the light. I am the power. I am truth. I am the way. Hallelujah. Now, he saves me. And I have the chance to now declare who he is inside of me. And so when I say, I, that's the soul, because that's what it is, am is the description of your spirit, and then your body, of course, is going to convey through its behavior that which you have in your spirit. But when you say something that is not biblical for him, you're not making a spiritual reality statement. You are making a flesh statement. Are you with me? Because there, there's no way that your spirit can say, I am defeated. It's not in the spirit language. It is not in the spirit. The Bible said if you walk in the spirit, you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. I didn't write it. I'm just reporting. Now, with this idea in mind, let us look at this. The spirit of Yahweh, he who is all that there is in victory in life, God, Elohim, the power, the one who has the power to produce, who did it in six days for which you rest and keep Sabbath. The spirit of Yahweh Elohim is upon me. You understand that? The spirit of Yahweh is upon me. The spirit of life is upon me. The spirit of anointing is upon me. Now, in Deuteronomy 6, when Yahweh commanded the children of Israel through the mouth of Moses that every Hebrew, every male Hebrew was to wear on the corner of his garment tzitzit so that they could remember something. This was his righteousness and that when they prayed, they would always cover themselves with a, that which symbolized the garment of his presence. And this was called the anointed cloth or the anointing. Now, I can wear this and not have any anointing at all. <laughs> okay? I don't have to wear this to not have the anointing. <laughs> I can wear this and still not have the anointing. Now, I can have the anointing and not have this. 
but I can also wear this and have the anointing. Are you with me? So there's four different things I can do with the anointing. This is simply the symbol. But they weren't born again yet. They weren't saved. They were on the program to be saved because they get saved the same way we do in reverse order. They look forward to the cross. We look back to the cross. No one gets saved without the blood of the Lamb. No one. Salvation. They look forward to He who was salvation. We now look back to our salvation to receive from the cross. So they drew from the cross by faith through types and shadows. So Father, in order to fulfill the Word, to increase their faith capacity, gave them these things so that they could learn and understand so that when the reality of the types and shadows would come, they would hear, receive, and be delivered. He hasn't changed his program, folks, in 6,000 years. Still works the same way. How many of you still need faith today? How many of you still need to see something? These are object lessons, that's all. Object lessons. In type and shadow, the Spirit of Yahweh is upon me. That means that every time I understand that, I start sensing something different. I start sensing He's here. The Spirit of Yahweh is upon me. Now, every person who's filled with the Spirit, at the moment He's filled with that Spirit, from that moment on, you have the anointing of the Spirit upon you. Now, the word to anoint is the same word in Hebrew. It is what? Mashiach, which is Messiah, anglicized. In Greek, it is Christos. One and the same word simply means anointing. And there were three anointings, which means to rub with oil. You had the prophet, you had the priest, you had the king. So when the Messiah came, there was an anointing upon him. He was what? Prophet, priest, and king. And the New Testament tells us that he is a prophet he is, a pre he is our high priest. He intercedes for us right now. What is he doing right this very moment? He's in heaven interceding for me as the high priest of the body of Christ, of the body of the anointed one. Not only is he the Christ, we are the body of Christ, which means that same anointing is on me for prophet, priest, and king. But it is an anointing that's on my spirit that only comes when I make the declaration as my soul is submitted to my spirit and I say, I am, I am anointed. The spirit of Yahweh Elohim is upon me. I've got to get that consciousness that all that He is, is on me. Hallelujah. His word, His power. The anointing breaks the yoke. That which breaks every bondage in my life is upon me. Notice the personal sense. It's on me. Because Yahweh hath anointed Mashiach me to proclaim good tidings. What are good tidings? Knowing that when you're in a bad situation, you're going to get out. If I told you you ain't going to make it, I can't proclaim good things. Well, it takes the anointing to give you something good. Why does it take the anointing? Why can't I just tell you good news without the anointing? Why do I need the anointing? Because I have no idea whether you're going to get out of it or not. Only the anointing can show me whether or not you're going to get victory. And that's the prophetic word. Prophet Ezekiel, he was a prophet. How did he get to be a prophet? He was Mashiach. The anointing was upon Ezekiel. Speak my word. So he says, go down to the valley of dry bones. Go down to a boneyard. Go down to a cemetery. Go down where there's nothing but total death. No life, nothing. They've, they've gone beyond troubles, folks. They've gone into non-existence. We've gone into a negative zone. He said, I want you to go to the boneyard and I want you to start speaking my word to the bones. Now, we've all heard the story and we can all get excited and we can shout and we can yell. But think about what he's really saying. How many of you have your boneyard? How many of you have your little private cemetery? I'll never function again in this realm. I'll never be happy again in this realm. It's dead. The anointing comes upon you. You're going to go down to your own graveyard. <laughs> You're going to go to your own funeral, so to speak. And he says, I want you to speak my word to the bone. And we all know what it was. 
the Hebrew word I want you to speak. This word, C-H-A-I, lie. I want you to speak lie. Greek word, that's in Hebrew. The Greek word is zoe. And if you get the Septuagint version, you'll read the word zoe in there. Speak life to the bones. Now, where's this life at? It's in your mouth. Romans 10, 4. The word is nigh thee, yea, even in thy mouth. What am I going to do with this word that's in my mouth? Speak my word to the problem. Are you getting the picture? But it takes the anointing to do that. Do you follow what I'm saying? But now there has to be a time when you can speak with authority to make sure that it's going to happen. Because the word of wisdom, which is one of the manifestive gifts of the Spirit, is the timing element. I've shared with you how many times where on the day of Pentecost, three o'clock in the afternoon, Peter and James were going up to the temple to pray and they saw a lame man that had been laying there at that gate how many years? Forty years. Every day this man was sitting at that temple gate to go into prayer. Well, if you go back to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you're going to find that Yeshua was there also every feast at that same spot where that same man sat. Yeshua healed the sick, preached His message, confronted the Pharisees, cleansed the temple in the presence of this man. And this man was never touched, never healed, never delivered. All the ministry of Christ. And yet on this day, Peter and John go up. They'd been there for 40 years. He wasn't new to Peter but all of a sudden, Peter saw something he never saw before. A word of wisdom was given. The anointing came upon him. Well, this is the moment for some good news for somebody. And he says to this man, I don't have silver, I don't have gold, but what I do have, I'm going to give you. And this man's life was changed because Peter began to operate in the anointing. And I used to ask the question, why didn't Yeshua heal him? Because Yeshua was saving it for Peter. Yeshua saw him every single day. He could have healed him. But he saved it for Peter as the body of Christ to extend the power and the anointing and Pentecost began as a day of power and healing and victory and deliverance. Peter spoke prophetically and we're trying to figure out, I wonder how Peter did that. There's all kind of prophecy messages out there about how Peter did it. Well, we need to fast more. We need to pray more. He was going up to pray. He hadn't come from a prayer meeting. He was going to pray. How would you like to have miracles take place before you even pray? We, 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 we brainwashed ourselves out of victory. No, not until I pray for at least two hours do I know I'm going to get the victory. You tied yourself into two more hours of bondage, not his word. Hallelujah. He hath anointed me to proclaim good tidings to the meek. He sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of Yahweh and the day of vengeance of our Elohim, to comfort all that mourn, to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they may be called trees of righteousness, the planting of Yahweh, that he may be glorified. And they shall build the old ways. This is where we get our name. The scripture. It's one of them. They shall raise up the former desolations. They shall repair or restore the wasted cities. That's our ministry, to restore wasted cities. Hallelujah. You look in your life and you say, well, there's a whole bunch of waste here. Welcome to the restoring anointing. The desolation of many generations. All right, now let's go to see where it was fulfilled at. Again, you go back to Luke 18. I'm sorry, Luke 3.18. Luke 18.3. 18, Luke 18, get dyslexic once in a while here. 4.18, what's the matter with me? Boy, I'm really out of it today. Wow. Okay, I'll get in tune here. Hallelujah. That's right, brain spring. Luke 4, verse 16. Now, I'm, I'm picking up where I left off six weeks ago. He came to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue when? On the Sabbath, the seventh day. 
And he stood up for to read, and there was delivered unto him the book of the... This was the first message that our Savior ever preached. It's the first recording of his first message. And if you were going to preach for the first time, what do you think our Savior is going to say the first time he gets into a synagogue, gets up, gets to open the Scriptures and preach? What's the first thing he's going to do? The first thing he's going to preach on is Isaiah 61. He's going to tell you what his mission is, and he's going to tell you when his mission is, and it's going to be on the very day that Deuteronomy 5.15 is talking about. I am your Passover, I'm here to deliver. There was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah, and when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of Yahweh is upon me. Now at this point, he took that scripture that had been written 750 years earlier and said, This is me. Do you have that right today to do that? Yes or no? How dare you say, I have the gift of the Holy Spirit, and you can't take that on you today. You have the right to say to yourself, the spirit of all that he is is upon me. I'm going to start talking to my boneyard. <laughs> I'm going to change some things in my life. Hallelujah. However, you've got to remember that words are containers. Right or wrong? Proverbs 18 says, the power of life and of death is in the tongue. With my tongue, I can kill. And with my tongue, I can restore. If you don't speak in the Spirit, under the anointing, all that you say, biblically, will fall on dead soil. When you speak, in the Spirit, by the Spirit, under the anointing of the Spirit, and you speak according to the wisdom gift and according to the knowledge gift, it will produce. And you can then say, the Spirit of Yahweh is upon me. Verse 20, he closed the book, he gave it again to the minister, sat down, the eyes of all them were in the synagogue were fastened on him, he began to say to them, this day, this Sabbath day, so the Sabbath was the day that the anointing was going to begin to be operated on in a special way in this town and in this city. Are you with me so far? Now, I'm not, I'm not uh, giving you my opinion. I'm just reporting what it says. Okay? This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. Folks, you, you need to learn every single day. At some point today, I've got to fulfill some scripture. Today, this scripture is going to be fulfilled in my life. Now, that's when Christianity becomes alive. And all bear him witness, wondered at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth, and they said, is not this Joseph's son? Why, he's just a, raising a carpenter's home. He, he has no pharisaical learning. He hasn't been to Bible school. Where would he come off with all these words? He doesn't seem to me that he's uh, had all this smarts and all this learning, but listen to the way he's speaking. Wow. And he said unto them, You will surely say unto me, This proverb, Physician, heal thyself. Whatsoever we have heard done in Capernaum, do also here in thy country. And he said, Verily I say unto you, No prophet is accepted in his own country, but I tell you of a truth. Many widows were in Israel in the days of Elias, when the heavens were shut up three years and six months, when great famine was throughout all the land. But unto none of them was Elias sent, save unto to Sarepta, a city of Sidon, and to a woman that was a widow. Many lepers were in Israel in the time of Elias the prophet, and none of them were cleansed, saving Naaman the Syrian. And all they in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath. Now, he had the ability, under the anointing, to make people mad. <coughs> because they were hearing not what they wanted to hear. But yet he was giving what it was going to take for them to be healed. And they rose up, thrust him out of the city, led him into the brow of the hill wherein their city was built, that they might cast him down headlong. But he, passing through the midst of them, while he had the anointing, went his way. And he came to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and taught on the way. Sabbath days. And they were astonished at his doctrine, for his word was with power. And in the synagogue there was a man which had a spirit. Verse 38, And he rose out of the synagogue, entered into Simon's house. Simon's wife's mother was taken with a great fever. They besought him for her. He stood over her, rebuked the fever. It left her, and immediately she arose, ministered unto them. These were all Sabbath miracles, folks. These were Sabbath miracles. Now I want to take you to the classic seven miracles that he did on the Sabbath to teach you something about why we're to remember the Sabbath for deliverance and what it really means. Let's go to the Gospel of John, chapter 5. Gospel of John, chapter 5. All of you have a Bible. 
And all of you have been reading it for years. And some of us read it and read words that we never see, that have been staring at us all the time. How many know we're getting ready for Passover again? The day of deliverance. Chapter 5, verse 1. After this, there was a feast of the Jews. What word do you think is there for the word feast? What do you think that word is? Moedim, that's right. Leviticus 23, what are the seven feasts of Yahweh? The seven steps to victory. What the word Moedim in Hebrew means what? Divine appointment. Divine appointment. Yahweh made seven appointments with mankind in Israel through types and shadows that at that very moment, on that very day, when the Messiah would come, He would absolutely set free. It's called the appointed time. As I've preached to you before, what do you do when you go to the doctor? You make an appointment. When you go to the dentist, what do you do? You make an appointment. It's called an appointment. The Hebrew word for appointment is moedim, translated feast. But it literally means in Hebrew, his appointment. He's made an appointment. He's called you to come. And when you have a toothache, you call the dentist and you try to figure out when can he see you. Now, most of the time, you have to work into his schedule. He can't work it into yours. Sometimes he can't take you for three days, but you're in pain now. You need an appointment now. And you can't even get an appointment now. He said, well, three days, that's the best I can do. I don't work on Sabbaths or, or Sundays. I mean, I mean, no, most offices are closed on the weekend. And it's always when the toothache hits. It's Friday night, right after they close, that's when everything hits. Well, I'm going to make an appointment. Now I've got to wait. I've got to suffer through the pain. Moedim. Now, there was a feast. And the feast is where Father said, when there is a feast, I want you to get food. I want you to bring the best food there is. I want to have a celebration. And I want you to come at a certain time. How many know that Father has a wedding feast coming up? You ever see anybody ever get a wedding? I've never heard of anybody that, that had a wedding and they didn't even know when it was. You're getting married? Yeah, when? I don't know. Nobody's ever got married without knowing. Because somewhere, one of them or both of them together are going to say, let's set the date. Let's set an appointment. What is the appointment for, folks? To make something happen. Hallelujah. Isn't that right? Why else would you set a wedding date if you didn't want to get married? You, you set a wedding date because you want to get married. Does that make sense? You, you set an, an appointment with a dentist because you want the dentist to do something in you. This is the word used here. A divine appointment that he made with his, the house of Judah... I'm coming up this time to do something. Well, what are you going to do? Well, let's find out what he did. Because you see, this miracle is trying to tell you, if you want a miracle, you have to do it when Father has his appointment schedule open. He has an appointment for you, folks. There was a feast of the Jews, and Yeshua went up to Jerusalem. Now, why did he tell them to have the feast at Jerusalem? Why didn't they have the feast everywhere else? Because Jerusalem in Hebrew means the city of peace. And peace means when all of his enemies or anything that is not of his nature is under your feet. If you want to get healing, you've got to go to Jerusalem. You've got to go where there's peace. You'll never be healed where there's not peace. Tension is not the place for healing. And so he taught them by types and shadows, you have to go to the new Jerusalem. You have to go to the Jerusalem. Now, in Hebrews 12, Paul says what? You and I now come every moment to the heavenly city, the new Jerusalem. How many of you know that that's where you can go? And there's a divine appointment schedule going on in Jerusalem. Hallelujah. Now, right now, you and I are currently in a divine appointment. According to Leviticus 23, verses 1 and 2, this is one of the appointments. Every seventh day is an appointment when Father said, I'm coming to do something. It's only on the seventh day. That's when he's going to do it. Let's see what he does on the seventh day. What is the principle he's trying to teach us? 
Now, there is at Jerusalem by the sheep market. See the word market there. If you've got a King James Bible, it's italicized, meaning it's not in the original. This is not a sheep market. It's actually a sheep gate. There is at Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool. In Hebrew, in Greek, the word is swimming pool. But in Hebrew, it also means a baptismal fount. There is at Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool which is called in the Hebrew tongue Bet Ezda or House of Ezda. And, and all the scholars can't figure out what Ezda means. They, 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 there's at least 12 different meanings that they give to this that have no correlation at all. The closest one in most fundamentalist scholars say it's called the House of Mercy. It had five porches. How many know five is the number of graves? In these lay a great multitude of what? Impotent folk. Folk who couldn't help themselves. The word actually in Greek comes from the word asenia. Paul says, when I am weak, asenia, then am I strong. When I feel unable to accomplish something. In this place, there was all kinds of people who had lost something in their physical being that made them unable to live a normal life. They were classified as incurables. And Adersheim even mentions the word in his book, The Life and Times of the Messiah, that the word actually refers to diseases of the nervous system. That's interesting. Several commentators followed it on his basis. I really don't know. In these lay a great multitude of impotent folk, blind, halt, withered, waiting for the moving of the water. What do you mean the moving of the water? What is this waiting for the moving of the water? For an angel went down at a... Well, what do you know? There's that word again. Again, same word, now translated different. How many know the word for season and the word for feast and the word for appointment is one and the same word in both Greek and Hebrew? For an angel went down at a Moedim. The angel had an appointment. I can only go down at certain times and when I go down, so everybody knew when it was. You with me? It went at a certain, it just, you know, when you read it in King James, and if you don't know Hebrew culture, you just say, well, we're just going to wait and see when it, whenever it moves. Maybe it won't move for the next five years. Wrong. It would move according to the divine appointments. When were the divine appointments? You can find them in Leviticus 23. The Sabbath, Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits, Pentecost, Feast of Trumpets, Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, and the Feast of Tabernacles total of almost 84 days out of the year there were divine appointments for deliverance that's a pretty good schedule an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water and whosoever then first after the troubling of the water stepped in was made whole of whatever disease he had and a certain man was there which had an infirmity 30 and 8 years when Yeshua saw him lie and knew that he had been now a long time in that case, he saith unto him, Wilt thou be made whole? You know, if you've had your problem for 38 years, or some of you aren't even that old, and you think you're already in trouble. This man had his problem for 38 years. If you have a problem for six months, you think it's tragic. If you have a problem for two years, you think you've got a problem. He had his problem for 38 years. And you know what he did during those 38 years? He went to the only place he knew where there would be a cure. He went to this place and waited for his appointment to come so he could be healed. Well, how come he hasn't been healed in 38 years? So the Savior said, do you want to be made whole? In other words, is there anything left in you or are you dead? Have you given up? you just laying here with a faint dream of maybe or it'll never. Have you finally decided what's the use? Do you really, do you still have the, the emphasis in the original language is, is there still a will in you? 
Is there still a desire in you to get treatment? Are you really able, after 38 years with this problem, are you now ready to get rid of it? What's your, where, where, where are you at with your will? Are you ready to make some choices? Are you ready for a change in your life? I don't know about you, but I'm saying yes. I'm ready for a change. The impotent man answered him, not understanding, of course. Well, sir, he didn't know who he was. I have no man when the water is troubled to put me into the pool, but while I am coming, another steps down before me. In other words, you know, for 38 years I've been here, and every single time this place is rustled up, I don't have a single person to help me. Somebody always gets in front of me. You ever notice when people are sick, they don't really care about anybody else? They only want it for themselves. This is what's tragic about the church. The church is filled with all kinds of sick people. They're not even sinners. Most of us as Christians can't wait till the altar calls over to get the sinners out of the way so the Christians can get down there and get some victory. And I'm not concerned about whether you get victory. I want victory. And so when the move of the Spirit comes, here I am, get a hold of me. Meanwhile, there's somebody back there who is so crippled, who is so hurt, and can't even get out of their seat, and they're just praying, well, I hope that pastor would come back and lay his hand on me, but no, he's too busy ministering to the first person who jumped into the wave of the Spirit. It doesn't happen today, does it? Yeshua said unto him, Rise, take up thy bed, and walk. Do you notice he didn't lay hands on him? Did you notice he didn't preach at him? Did you notice he didn't say a single word about faith? This man was not prepped spiritually. I hope you're going to get something out of this. This man was not prepped spiritually. This miracle had nothing to do with faith. It had to do with proving a point for a Sabbath experience, for what Sabbath means to those that finally found its story put into the Word. Rise. He simply told this man, in spite of his condition, be healed. And immediately the man was made. How fast? Immediately. He took up his bed and walked. And on, now, now look at the next phrase. And on the same day was the Sabbath. Do you understand that the Sabbath is a day for total healing? including the things that you're so weak in, you don't even have the energy to do anything about it. You don't even have the faith to reach out, and yet it can be your day for victory. The Jews, therefore, said unto him that was cured, It is the Sabbath day. It is not lawful for thee to... Now, they already had their rules for what you could and could not do on the Sabbath day. Do you know that your mentality of what you think about a thing determines how you act on that thing? Because Sabbath to them had become a what? Ritual. The feeling of what somebody needed was superpassed by what we could or could not do on that day. Church service has to follow a certain form. Yeshua will come at any point. He'll break that form because He's after meeting the needs of the people. It is not lawful for thee to carry that. And here was a man who just got healed. Do you think they're excited about his healing? Absolutely. They could care less that he was healed. We've got a long nose coming in. It is not lawful for thee to carry thy bed. It's against the law. We don't care if you got happy. We don't care what it is. You're not allowed to get this thing on this day. You cannot be involved in it. He answered them, He that made me whole, the same said unto me, Take up thy bed and walk. Hey, don't blame me. I just had somebody who commanded me to take up my bed and walk, and that's what I'm doing. I'm following another commander. Then asked they him, What man is this which said unto thee, Take up thy bed and walk? And he that was healed wist not who it was, for Yeshua had conveyed himself away, a multitude being in that place. And afterwards Yeshua findeth him in the temple and said unto him, Behold, thou art made whole. Uh-oh. What do you read next? What did that have to do with the healing? This man was sick for 38 years. Do you understand the picture? And there was no mention made of cause, effect, or anything. It was simply, this is your day, this is your hour, be restored. And it was on the Sabbath. 
All of a sudden, Yeshua goes back, finds this man, and says to him, You're now whole. Sin no more, lest the worst thing come unto thee. In the original, it plainly says he had his disease because of a sin in his life. You know that sin can cause disease? What causes ulcers? Worry. Prolonged worry. Your body isn't made to dwell in tension. Your body can't handle tension. It'll get sick. When you have bitterness in you for years. So when he got healed, it now told him, okay, your body's healed, but you know what? We need to solve some other problems that are in you spiritually and emotionally and, and, and so forth. Okay? Behold, thou art made whole. Sin no more, lest the worst thing. In other words, if you don't change something in your life, you're going to be worse than you are today, and I can't stop it from happening. Now, this only happens a couple times in the Scriptures. Unfortunately, preachers take this and imply every time you're sick, it's because you've sinned. Remember when the disciples came to him and they said, well, this man's born blind. Who sinned? He or the parents. Remember that? You see, there was a doctrine that you couldn't have anything go wrong with you unless you had blown it. And our Savior said, neither his parents sinned, nor did he sin. Blindness is not always a cause of sin. Oh, sin can cause blindness, but it's not always the cause. See, we, we get so egotistical and parasitical that we already know that everything is negative. We're so easy to condemn. Just like when Yeshua had the woman caught in the act of adultery. They all wanted to stone her, the hypocrites. Then he said, well, which of you has never sinned? Let him cast the first stone. But then he looked at her and he says, where are your accusers? I don't condemn you. I don't judge you. Wait a minute. She was just caught in adultery. Why don't you condemn her? There are some strange things going on in the Word. This person has a sickness and they never sinned. This person has a sickness, they sin. So it's not up to you and I to sit there and say, well, they're sick because of. You follow what I'm saying? Because not every sickness is based on sin. There's all kinds of things that can cause sickness. You've got to find the cause. Our Savior only mentions them when they are a root cause that produces a side effect. In the case of this man, there was a sin problem. When do you deal with sin problems? When do you deal with disease? When do you cure the incurables? Seventh day. Seventh day. Am I saying that he only does these things on the seventh day? Nope, didn't say that at all. Well, I just heard you say that. You just said, on the seventh day. Well, that's what the Word says, on the seventh day. He did it. He can do this anytime he wants. As I showed you the chart, there are six days in which you must work to fulfill the Word. You've got to get light. You've got to separate the waters. You've got to establish the resurrection principles in your life. You've got to bring forth fruit in your life. You've got to establish a work ministry whereby you begin to reach out and minister to people, which are the birds of the air and the fish of the sea, the animal life, various characteristics like lamb theology, ox theology, lion theology, man theology. What, what, what is the element? Because all life was created to, to, to give you an example of the life that's in him. He was the lion of the tribe of Judah. What does that mean? The prophet said, when a lion roars, anybody finish that for me? When a lion roars, who can but fear? How many know that the lion has the ability to produce fear in its ear? Including a big elephant that four times its size could literally step on the lion and wipe him out, but the elephant in his own nature cannot handle the, the vibratory sound that comes to him from the lion's mouth. And so our Father, who created the lion, now says, I'm going to teach you some spiritual principles about the lion and why my son is called the lion of the tribe of Judah. Not the tribe of Simeon. Not the tribe of Joseph. The tribe of Judah. What 
is the lion. The cherubim have the face of a lion. One of the overcomer groups in Revelation 4 is called the lion. They've been redeemed by the blood of the lamb. What is a lion? When the lion roareth, who can but fear? And when Yahweh speaketh, who can but prophesy? That's the whole verse. Yahweh likens himself to a man who speaks with the anointing, who speaks with authority and with power, becomes the voice of the spiritual lion on this earth. And when we speak with spiritual authority, we roar like the lion of the tribe of Judah. Every demon in hell trembles. That's why the devil walks about as a roaring lion. Nowhere does the Bible say the devil is a lion. It said he imitates. You know what it means? If you're born in Christ, and he is the lion, you're all cubs. Matthew is the gospel of the lion, one who speaks with authority, with power, who rules in kingdom authority, and why the lion is called the king of the wild beast. You're to become a lion, saint, just like you can become an eagle, saint, living in the heavenlies. The eagle is called the king of the birds. Why? Because it can fly higher than any bird, faster than any bird. It has the ability to look directly into the face of the sun and not be blinded. Oh, that we're going to rise up with wings as of eagles. We can look into the face of the sun, S-O-N. We can behold his glory and see who he is. And eagles hate serpents. And when an eagle sees a serpent, he knows he's got one task, destroy. The computer beam goes off inside of the eagle. A pulsating beam, destroy, enemy in line, destroy, enemy in line. And the eagle can be two miles above the ground, spot the serpent, zoom down full power, grab that serpent in his hands, and then he flies up into the upper atmosphere of the heavenlies, and then he finds his home called the rock. And then he takes the serpent and he nosedives into the rock and smashes the serpent against the rock. And then the eagle flies into the air, showing his victory. And our father said, I delivered you, O Israel, as the eagle. Why is the eagle the national emblem of the United States? Because this country was founded on the book of the eagle. We must understand that it's victory life and the fact that it becomes Satan destroyers and instead we've let Satan come in and destroy us. The Father has a divine appointment to destroy. Gospel of John is the Eagle Saint book. Early church taught this. The four faces of the cherubim, the face of the lion, one who speaks with authority. The face of the ox, one who speaks with compassion and servanthood. The face of a man, one who speaks in righteousness and the eagle who lives in the heavenlies blue being the color and the nature of truth. He speaks with truth. And as I've told you over and over, when the truth sets you free, you will have the ability to live righteously. And when you live righteously, you'll then become a servant and you'll serve others. And until you learn to serve, you will never rule. And to those who rule without serving, they will never make it because it's only in the spirit that you can rule. Our Savior lived in that realm. He was the cherubim. He was the four faces. Matthew was the face of Christ as the lion of the tribe of Judah. Mark is the gospel where he is the face of the ox. Luke is the face of the Son of Man, and the gospel of John is the face of the eagle. You're in him, folks. You've got the four faces in you. What is the expression on your face? The expressions work in harmony with divine appointments. You've got to know, folks, when and how to operate spiritual law. And so he comes in verse 14 and he tells this man, okay, I've, I've, I've removed the effect. I want you to notice something here. That his disease that he had for 38 years was the effect. You and I get so hung up in the effect of our problem, we forget how we got there. And Father said, if you don't want to repeat this experience again in your life, then you're going to have to change the root cause that's in the problem. Now, some people have never read John 5 like this, but I want you to see something as we close. Verse 15, The man departed and told the Jews that it was Yeshua which had made him whole, and therefore did the Jews persecute Yeshua and sought to slay him because he had done these things when? On the Sabbath day. And Yeshua answered them and said, My father worketh hitherto, and I work. 
Now, wait a minute. You're not supposed to work on the Sabbath. You know what it said? Thou shalt not work on the Sabbath. This was the Sabbath. They got mad because he healed on the Sabbath. And then Yeshua uses this unbelievable phrase, I work. Wait a minute. He's the Sabbath. Why can't... You mean healing a person who, who, who was an incurable is a work? It, does it take work to deliver you? Is deliverance a work? Is Sabbathing working deliverance? Yes. Therefore the Jews sought the more to kill him, because he not only had broken the Sabbath, but said also that Elohim was his father, making himself equal with Elohim. Now, beginning at verse 19 to verse 47, any of you have a red letter edition? Have you noticed that the rest of it is just his words speaking back to the Pharisees? Now, everything he says, in, and I don't have time today, folks. I could spend the next month just on this section alone trying to explain it as it relates to this miracle because everything he says in this context is something to do with this paralytic man. Are you with me? But most people read this and never associate the two. The entire fifth chapter of John is a Sabbath lesson. He heals, shows the root, and then explains to those who have no eyes why he must do what he does. And we haven't even seen it. Let me just mention a couple in passing. Verse 19, Then answered Yeshua and said unto them, who said, You can't do these things on this day. Now how many of you have thoughts that go through your mind? Well, he's not going to heal me today. Nothing is going to happen to me today. Let me tell you something. If you learn how to use red letter editions, these are statements that our Savior uses against all of those arguments. Because the argument to the Pharisees is just another argument for Satan on you. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the Son can do nothing of himself, but what he seeth the Father do. For what things soever he doeth, these also doeth the Son likewise. In other words, when you see me do what I just did, you're seeing the Father. Now, the Father's the one that set up the Sabbath. And so what you're doing is you're actually watching a living demonstration of the Sabbath, you hypocrites. What is the Sabbath? Sabbathing in your mentality is your hour for deliverance. I'm going to rest in the finished work of Calvary. I'm going to trust Him for what He's already... How many of you are trying to make something happen when He's already made it happening? You're trying to enforce His victory in yourself. No, you have to stand and enforce His victory, period. The Son can do nothing in Himself. Whatever He does, He does because it's by divine appointment. And the Son sees how the Father does it, therefore that's how I do it. Until you can see what the Father wants to do, you yourself cannot get it done. For the Father loveth the Son. Now this is an interesting word, because for years I taught the three loves, the agape, the phileo, and the eros. Our spirit was designed for agape, and our soul was designed for phileo. And in almost all scriptures, it tells us that we must have the agape of Father. Isn't that what it says? There's a strange word right here. It says, for the Father loveth the Son. The word is not agape. Hmm. Hmm. The Father, filio, phileo. The Father, phileo, the Son. Exact contrast that when you get to the end of John, Yeshua says to Peter, do you love me? Do you agape me? Yea, I phileo you. We've told you the story. No, 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 no. Do you agape me? Yes, I fillet you. Okay, Peter, do you fillet me? Yes, I do. Here it is the Father fillet. I thought fillet was not spiritual. There's nothing wrong with fillet, folks. It's when fillet doesn't operate by agape. Because fillet is simply that part of your nature that deals with your emotions. And what he's trying to say is the Father doesn't have just a spiritual love for me, he loves me emotionally. The Father has emotional, passionate feelings for me. <laughs> Hallelujah. 
Hallelujah. Now, how many know that you're supposed to be in Him? You've got to think like Him. Philippians 2, 5. Let this mind, King James, the ASV actually does a better job. Let this attitude, because that's the actual word in Greek. Let this attitude, let this concept be in your mind. Learn to see how He sees so you can think like He thinks. So in thinking like he thinks, you will now act like he acts because your actions are simply the embodiment of your thinking. Whatever you and I say, whatever it is you and I do, it's the result of our thinking. And he says, now if you think like him, you're going to act like him. And he is always Sabbathing. Oh, if I could just get... See, you've got to learn how to Sabbath seven days a week. That's what Hebrews 4 is all about. There is a rest. There is a Sabbath to the people of Yahweh. New Testament, not Old Testament. You've got to learn how to put seventh day into every day of your week. You've got to learn how to rest in the finished work. You've got to learn how to claim your victory and know that you have some good results coming to you. Hallelujah. The Father liveth the Son, showeth him all things, and that himself doeth. And he will show him greater works than these, that you may marvel. For as the Father raiseth up the dead... Now, wait a minute. This man was not dead. Why is he using this analogy when nobody dead was raised up? How many know there's more in you that's dead than just the final result of you being dead? This man was dead in a part of his body, wasn't he? He was dead in a part of his soul. Do you understand what this is saying? Most preachers read this and they put this way off in the future resurrection terms. This is a... Today verse, hallelujah. It is a Sabbath verse. There are areas in you that have just died and you don't even know. Now you've got to go to your burial ground and speak life. For as the Father raiseth up the dead and quickeneth. See that word quickeneth? What's the word there for quickeneth in the original? Anybody know? Zoe. Hebrew word chai. Same word again for life. Same word that Ezekiel was told to speak to the boneyard, the same word that describes the essence of the name of Yahweh and Yeshua, because in him is life, in him is Zoe. He says, For the Father raises up the dead and Zoe's them, or life's them. That's the literal rendering there. And life's them. <laughs> How many of you need to come alive? And the word come alive there means come alive with resurrection power. You know what resurrection power means? Once you get resurrected... There ain't no returning back to death. Now, would you like to get to a point where right now there's no life, but tomorrow there's life and there'll never again be death in that area? Now, that's what this man was, this, this is what he was trying to teach because he did a healing. Did you notice he didn't heal everybody in there? He only took, he took one of the worst cases. He singled out this man. This man did not single out Yeshua. Yeshua singled him out knowing that just by this one man he would raise Cain in the whole city of Jerusalem and get the whole Jerusalem council on top of him so he could give these words right here that you and I could read for the rest of our lives to understand what it is he's doing and saying. For as the Father raises up the dead and lifes them, even so the Son lifes whom he will. Hallelujah. Has he willed you, folks? Life has now been given to the Son. You just saw an example of it. Does he want to do that to you? Absolutely. For as the Father, now watch this, as the Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son. Now, you know what Christians do? We read that word judgment. Well, that's the last judgment. That's the day when, I, when I'm on the other side. No! He wants to make a judgment today in your life. Do you know what the judgment is? The judgment is I want to judge, the, I want to bring life into your dead situation. That's judgment. When Ezekiel was told to go down to the valley of dead bones and speak his word, that was a day of judgment to the bones. Why? The bones were going to be judged. They weren't going to be dead anymore. I don't know about you, but that's good judgment. You know, judges don't just speak negative words. Judges speak positive words. This is the day of judgment. My flesh is going to be judged. My problem is going to be judged. Hallelujah! I'm going to lose my problem! Let's get some judgment going here. Uh, how do you speak? My problem is guilty. <laughs> yes, it's going to leave. Now, some of you can get excited, and some of you don't even know yet what I'm saying, huh? For the Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son. 
Now, how many remember in Corinthians, Paul says, do you not know that you and I will judge the world and that you and I will judge angels? Me? Me? Psalms 149. We're going to judge kings, politicians. This honor have all the saints. Hallelujah. That's the way Psalms 149 reads. You need to read Psalms 149 every day when you read politics. It'll help you. It'll encourage you. Bill Clinton will not like this message. Nor our congressman. But hath committed all judgment unto the Son, that all men should honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. He that honoreth not the Son, honoreth not the Father, which is sent him. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that hears my word. Now, here's the key. He that hears my word. Shema. Word does not mean hear with the outer ear so that it attaches itself to the brain. The word hear here means to hear with the inner ear, hear what the Spirit, the anointing, hear what the Spirit, remember, the Spirit of Yahweh is upon me, hear what the Spirit is saying to the ecclesia. What's the ecclesia? Ekkelel, which means to call out, ecclesia, from which we get the word church, but originally, ecclesia meant the ruling class in a city. The word ecclesia literally means the ruling class, those that have the rule. You know what the church is? It's the rulership of Christ. Aren't the rulers supposed to have judgment? What is the position of you as a Christian? You are to pass judgment on the same things that Father has passed judgment on. Has he judged sin? So should you. Get rid of it. Has he judged sickness? So should you. Be healed. <laughs> Hallelujah. Has he judged poverty? Yeah, so you better get prosperous. Do you, you understand what I'm saying? Hallelujah. He that heareth my word, to hear with the inner ear and respond, is the word, and faith cometh by what? Faith cometh by hearing. He that heareth my word, or respondeth by faith, and believeth on him that sent me, hath everlasting, there's that word life again, same word for quickeneth earlier, it's the same word, zoe, or chai, and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. What did this man do? He passed from death unto life. What do you do every time you pray the word over your situation? You're passing out of death unto a life situation. You're passing out. Not passing out, but passing out. Okay. Colossians 1.13, we have been translated out of the kingdom of darkness and into the kingdom of his dear son. You are not under the authority and the control of Satan any longer, folks. You're not under it. Well, then why is it controlling you? Well, who said it's controlling you? Well, it feels like it. The Bible said you've already been translated out. Now, I want to ask you a simple question in closing. How many know that when you get the new body, the power goes through, I'm, I'm changed in the twinkling of an eye, right, and we're on our way up? How would you like to get about eight miles up and all of a sudden it doesn't hold. <laughs> and you start to fall back into the flesh. <laughs> right? <laughs> now, how many have ever heard about preachers talking about it could happen? Have you heard it? I have never heard this. I don't know any preacher that believes that on the way up some of us may come back down. No, I hear that all of us on the way up are going up and so shall we ever be with him. Hallelujah. You understand that? If your body gets it, it gets to keep it because he's not an Indian giver. He doesn't decide, well, wait a minute. I do remember something we haven't dealt with while you were still an earthling. I think I'm going to put you back into the flesh and let you drop back down. No, 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 folks, no. Once you're translated, that's it. Well, how many of you understand that your spirit, when you were born again, has already been translated? It is not and never can be under the power of Satan again. So when you walk into the spirit, you automatically are over the devil, although in your soul area, the devil is against you. Five areas. Where to be the head? Then why do some of you keep wagging? Now, I love dogs. But I never wanted to be one. But I'll tell you what, if I had to be a dog, 
I know which end of the dog I want to be. I do not want to be the backside of a dog. Yet the Bible tells us that if you are in poverty, you are in disease, and you are in sin perpetually, you are a tail. <laughs> and he doesn't want you to be the tail, folks. The issue is not, are you a tail? No, the issue is, would you like to stop it? Would you like to become the head? Then we've got to learn how to start passing judgment as the body of Christ. How can I judge the world with him if I can't even judge where I am in my own life today, which is a Sabbath experience of victory? You know why he's working? Because Sabbath can never happen until there's no more devil. Sabbath can never happen until there's no more pain. Sabbath can never happen until there's no more discord. Sabbath can never happen until everything is perfectly righteous. I don't know about you, but there, we're a long way from Sabbath. And so Yeshua said, I'm working because we can't Sabbath until I remove all of the problems. And let me give you an example of one of them. Hey, fella, come here. 38 years, it's time. I'm Sabbathing my work you say well i want to work in his kingdom guess what your work is bringing people to sabbath not just to a sabbath service this is only the type and shadow this is not the reality the reality of sabbath is when you have no more problems he is working in your life to bring you to a point where there are no more problems but the judgment has to begin with you you understand what i'm saying the anointing is upon you Well, we'll just have to maybe pick up here next week. There are seven miracles. This is number one of the seven miracles of healing on the Sabbath that deals with Isaiah 61 and Luke 4.18. Seven different cases that, that look at Sabbath from seven different angles where the Savior is trying to say to you and me, I want you at liberty. I want you happy. I want you blessed. I want you encouraged. I don't care where you've been. It's where I'm going to take you. Hallelujah. I want to give you some hope. I want to give you some joy. I want to give you some excitement. Hallelujah. That's Sabbath. I don't know about you, but I'm learning how to love the Sabbath. Now I can give you that famous verse that we read every Sabbath meal in Isaiah 58. We'll close this service with that scripture. Isaiah 58, verse 13, If thou turn away thy foot from the Sabbath from doing thy pleasure on my holy day and call the Sabbath a delight. I want you to learn to call the Sabbath a delight. The Hebrew word is oneg. Does anybody know what an oneg is? That's not an eggnog. I want you to call the Sabbath oneg. In Hebrew it means Rejoicing with joy, rejoicing with food, rejoicing with entertainment, rejoicing with hilarity, getting excited, having fun. That's Oneg. I want you to call the Sabbath Oneg. Excitement. When do you do this? If you can't start doing it every seventh day, you're not going to be able to do it the first, the second, the third, the fourth, the fifth, and the sixth. Are you with me? Because the Sabbath teaches you something. And call the Sabbath a delight. This is what you're to call it. The holy of Yahweh. The holy. Holy means no sickness. No disease. Nothing negative. No want. You call it honorable. And shall honor him not doing your own ways, nor finding your own pleasure, nor speaking your own words, then shalt thou delight thyself in Yahweh, and I will cause thee to ride upon the high places of the earth and feed thee with the heritage of Jacob thy father, for the mouth of Yahweh has spoken it. Oh, how many of you want to ride on the high places and get tired and get rid of your valleys? Hmm? Folks, let me tell you something. This promise only goes with Sabbath keepers. But I'm not talking about Sabbath in terms of what day do we go to church, because that's not what the Sabbath is all about. Sabbath is not what day do we worship on. You're, you're to worship him seven days a week. It's not an issue of Saturday or Sunday. 
Saturday is the Sabbath, but it teaches us something else because Saturday, uh, Sabbath is a 24-hour period of rejoicing in a special way. And if you don't learn what Sabbathing is, you'll never be able to take the Sabbath and put it into the rest of your week, which is the Sabbath. Trying to teach you a spiritual principle of total rest means no devil in your life. None! How many of you would like to have no devil in your life? Could you call the Sabbath a delight? I could. Well, that's where we're going, folks. I hope with this Sabbath series that you're going to grab something out of it, find some victory in your life, and realize that Father really does want you free. But I'm here to tell you that although this is a type and shadow according to Colossians 2, 15 and 16, it is also meant to be fulfilled because he came to fulfill the types and shadows, and he is our Sabbath. Amen? You know what that means? That means since this is the Sabbath, it's a divine appointment, he wants every one of you free today. He does not want you to leave this Sabbath without being free. Can you handle that? Every one of you here today have the right to get what this one man got in his life. All you have to do is be willing to hear the word and respond to life by learning to speak the words of life. Hallelujah. Father, we ask for that anointing that you have given upon yourself and to your body to become applicable and applied to our life today right where we are, that you are our victory. You are our joy. You are our delight. We receive you now in all that you stand for, that you've come to set us free. You had said whom the Son of Yahweh sets free is free indeed. To stand fast in the liberty wherein Hamashiach, the Messiah, has set us free that we would know the truth and the truth would make us free. You've come for no other purpose than to set us free from all tyranny, all negative thinking, all destructive acts in this world. No weapon formed against us will prosper for our righteousness is of Yahweh Yeshua. How we praise you, how we magnify you, and how we receive this work of grace now. We therefore take authority over all demonic forces of hell that have an assignment against this church, that have an assignment against the individual families and homes represented in this church, against every person in this room, every assignment that is against them. We break that assignment now through the name of Yeshua HaMashiach. We bind the power of the enemy this hour from this Sabbathing experience Right now, we bind that influence of destructive power from this assembly. And we loose this assembly into divine living and into divine health. I bind every adverse poverty spirit that would wound and attack and try to hinder the Word from being made manifested in their life. I declare your power upon this people now in completeness to heal and to restore them, Father, that the joy of Yahweh will become their strength. I bind every disease. We bind every sickness upon each of these families. Father, we bind this sickness that is upon our sister Louise. Right now we curse all sickness upon her body and claim Sabbathing for her as a substitute father. We claim that victory as her brothers and sisters in Christ. We claim healing for you are Yahweh Rapha. We lift her to you, Father, asking for the healing power. We bind disease. We bind pain in the name that is above every name, the name of of Yahweh, Yeshua, Hamashiach. We loose the blessings of Abraham upon this congregation that they may be the head and not the tail, that they may be above and not beneath, that they will now begin to lend and not borrow, that they will walk in health and not in sickness, and they will walk in prosperity and not in poverty. In that name we pray. And everyone said, Amen. Receive it, saints. Receive it. Let us stand for the blessings.